Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. So a big thank you at the outset to Intelligence Squared, to our great panel, and to all of you for being here. Our discussion tonight, the theme, China, friend or foe. So before we get started with the panel, let's just check what your thoughts are. Let's just check the mood of the room with a quick show of hands. So all those who start with the position China friend, could you give me a hands up? I'm going, to get, um, I'm going to get the panel to help me measure how many do you think roughly that is show of hands? Percentage of the room. It's probably about 30? Something like that. Something about 30? Okay. China foe, hands up. Probably rough, pro roughly the same. So does that leave about... 40% of don't knows. How many of you are don't knows? Let's have a show of hands. Yeah. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> a third, a third, a third. A third, a third, a third, says Malcolm. Um, so, obviously, a huge um, question. And in no particular order, I just r thought earlier today, random news stories running through my head, some of the things that have happened in the last few days, the last few weeks. A Chinese billionaire described Australia as a giant baby after it revoked his visa over influence operations. Um, some of the big corporations, Caterpillar, Apple, Jaguar Land Rover, warned that China's economic slowdown was damaging their sales and damaging their profits. A Chinese ambassador, accused Canada of white supremacy after the arrest, as you will remember, of a Huawei, senior Huawei executive in Canada, and then the subsequent arrests of two Canadians and um, death sentence for a third Canadian in China. China landed on the far side of the moon. An Air New Zealand flight was turned around in midair en route from Auckland to Shanghai, reportedly due to problems over references to Taiwan in its documentation. Closer to home, here, the UK has seen more applications for entry to its universities from China and Wales in early 2019. Oh, sorry, from China and Hong Kong in early 2019 <laughs> than, it, than it has from Wales. <laughs> <laughs> China and Wales, that's a good combo. Um, and uh, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, just to finish off this little a, a random list of stories, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer um, had his visit to China cancelled after the UK Defence Secretary um, said a new aircraft carrier would be deployed uh, to, on a freedom of navigation mission to the South China Sea when it's operational. Uh, the Huawei Cyber Security Evaluation Center said it could only give a limited assurance that there was no national security threat from Huawei's operations in telecoms in this country. The National Cyber Security Center said risk should be manageable. Talks to avert an escalation in the trade war between the world's two economic superpower continue. So, China friend or foe, it is a complex question, as just that brief list uh, demonstrates. But we will attempt to navigate it this evening and to make it a little easier to do so, we're going to divide the discussion into three parts. We're going to start with economics and economic relations. We are then going to move on to security and then we're going to have a discussion about values. And obviously, all these three shade into one another, but we'll roughly follow that, um, that route. Let me now introduce the panel who are going to do the work for us uh, on the question of China friend or foe. So at the far end, Martin Wolf, who is Associate Editor and Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times. His most recent book, The Shifts and the Shocks, What We've Learned and Have Still to Learn from the Financial Crisis. Ke Yujin, in the middle, a Beijing-born professor of economics at the London School of Economics. And uh, Ke Yu is a specialist in macroeconomics, international macroeconomics, that is, and the Chinese economy. And closest to me, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, a veteran conservative politician who served as defense secretary and foreign secretary. And in the mid-90s, um, as foreign secretary, he managed the last stages of the handover of Hong Kong to China. He has also more recently chaired the Commons Intelligence and Security Committee, which oversees the work of MI5, MI6, and GCHQ. So, enough from me. I'd like to ask each of you three now to give us a brief outline of your 
top answer to the question, China friend or foe. Martin, do you want to get us started? You have one minute, max two. Okay. Um, well, I'm very much in the with the third group uh, who uh, refuse to choose between friend or foe. And I think that's the right position to take. Um, the first reason is I don't think it's a very helpful category in thinking about our relationship with this country. Um, and the second reason, which I think is very, very important, is that whether China turns out to be a friend or foe depends only to a modest degree on objective circumstances, but I think to a very considerable degree on how we treat it. So we're working very hard, particularly in the US, to make it a foe, but that's not because of the intrinsic nature of the relationship, but because of how we behave. We are important actors. The key point to understand is that China is an enormously important reality, a huge power, a huge country, non-Western, with a very different system of our ours, and what we are going to have to do is work out a relationship which is as productive as it possibly can be, because it's not going away. And so I define the proper relationship, and have done so in several pieces, as, be, as one of, I hope, productive competition and cooperation. And managing that balance is what our future in the world is going to depend on. Thank you. Koyu. Um, I think the world needs more friends these days uh, than foes, and it's important to cast China in the light, right uh, light. Um, on the one hand, the world and the West tells China, well, you are a big country, it's time to take up greater responsibilities. And on the other hand, it chastises China for too much engagement. Uh, but what is too much engagement? Um, it has become one of the largest financial supporter um, to international organizations, UN peacekeeping. It is funding about $340 billion of infrastructure, infrastructure deficit in the world, and offering $60 billion of financial assistance to um, Africa. For every $1 that the US spends on a clean energy investment, China spends three, and it's spending about, uh, it's taking up about half of the global investment now on uh, renewable uh, energy. More importantly, China is deeply enmeshed in the global system. It does well when other countries do well. That is probably the single most compelling reason for why China is supporting globalization and upholding uh, multilateralism. So the important thing, and I completely agree with Martin, is how do we align the interests of China with the interest of the rest of the world. And demonizing China is not going to solve some of the deeper intractable issues in Western liberal democracies, but demonizing it could potentially lead to self-fulfilling uh, prophecies. Thank you, and welcome. Well, we hope China would be a friend. It now looks as if it may end up as a foe, but I think as we speak, the jury's still out. What is clear is that the single most important political development of this century will be the emergence of China as the other superpower. The United States, since the end of the Soviet Union, has had it all to itself. I would make a couple of points that limit what China has achieved. I, it's quite obviously a dramatic transformation. But you know, what China is doing now, in terms of its economic strength, is where China ought to have been 50 years ago. And if it hadn't been for the lunacy of Mao Zedong, great leaps forward, cultural revolution, we have always known that's where China would end up, where they are now. We know that because other Chinese societies, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Singapore, all effectively Chinese, have shown that they are exceptionally good capitalists. So China has caught up with them. It hasn't yet overtaken them. Second point is that China would have the world believe that there is, they represent an alternative model to the West because of their remarkable economic achievements, and that you don't want to have the kind of democratic societies that we aspire to or actually enjoy. That too is a false argument, because when you think about it, the, the other Asian countries of a comparable economic success to China 
Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, not only have a comparable economic achievement, but they have done so combined with the rule of law and combined with democratic societies for their citizens. So the final point I make <clears throat> is that we're not talking about a choice between Western values and Chinese uh, characteristics. What we're talking about is whether China will eventually realize that its own people are entitled to the same liberties, not just as Western countries, but as their Asian neighbors in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And then the question of friend or foe uh, will become much easier to address and resolve. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of you for setting out your stalls there. Um, now we're going to divide up a bit and start with the economics and drill down into that. And so, Martin, I wonder if you could set us off with this question. I mean, if we'd been having this conversation three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, under a Cameron Osborne government, the talk was of a golden era, win-win, it was all about the friend. What went wrong to that? I think the, um, probably two things uh, have uh, happened, and the second is far the more important. The, the first thing that has happened is a sense uh, in the world outside, and I think it's a sense which is not entirely unreasonable, not unfounded, that the Chinese economy itself has very substantial problems that the transitions it's going through are now very, very complex. The government is not completely in control of what's going on. And some of the directions it's taking, and Malcolm has touched on that, in terms of the relationship between the state and the economy, are not ones which many economists in the West uh, think are going to work very well. There's a recent very interesting book by one Western specialist, Nick Lardy, which really emphasizes this idea uh, that uh, this is a block transition. Perhaps that's one way of thinking about it. But the second reason, much the more important, is that Western policymakers and above all American policymakers have decided that the rise of China is a major strategic threat. And this has several dimensions, and it's just sort of taken them a while to notice. One is that, uh, if you can broadly define it, the left of center has come to the view very much like, Michael, well, you know, they're never gonna become a democracy as we thought they would. That's very problematic, we don't like that. But the, the bigger element of it is, which is I think the view of the strategic community in America, and quite a big chunk of the, of, the, of the corporate community is that these people are a serious threat. They have immense resources. The defense buildup is very substantial. Uh, and they are getting ahead technologically in some very important areas. And we are far too dependent upon them. In fact, the very interdependence, which I very much agree is so valuable, they find frightening. And this um, uh, paranoia, I think, has now become a dominant element in American thinking, and it's shaping Mr. Trump's policies, a bubble in trade policy, which we're going to get to. And um, it has shifted very quickly, and I think very much across the board, uh, American attitudes, but we're also seeing it now even in Europe, notably very interesting paper recently from the German Industrial Confederation, which was basically saying, you know, the Chinese technology policy, it's a threat to Germany. This is a big change and it's happened quite recently. Kaya, I want to ask you about this. Do you think that this, this, this sense of fear, competition, paranoia, is that sour grapes? Is that just China's just doing a great job of competing, of innovating, and actually the world has woken up from its complacency and is now afraid. Well, first of all, I certainly want to say this kind of tension and hostility is a one-way street. China doesn't want to uh, uh, engage uh, with the world or with the US in this manner. Um, China's economic success uh, has proven to be uh, well, first of all, China believes that it's a populous country and therefore it has to be large, necessarily. Um, in terms of uh, trade competition, China now recognizes 
that yes, China has benefited so much from globalization, it's time to give back. It is prepared to pay a higher price and to bear more responsibilities, and this is probably why we're going to likely see um, many concessions but to be trade. That's a separate question. I, mean, I suppose the question that I'm trying to get at is the argument that that we hear from, you know, from Europe and from North America, that it's not a level playing field from China, that it's all about no access to markets, it's all about stealing technology and so on. Is it that that's the problem, or is it just that China's competing really well? Well, that's the perception, but if you think about why companies like eBay and Amazon, uh, which had no government interference whatsoever, uh, were uh, driven out of the market, it's purely because of this ferocious domestic competition inside the technological sector within the country. Alibaba is one of 12,000 e-commerce uh, platforms. Um, the group buying business is one of 6,000. So there is a ferocious competitive environment, and that is why many of the foreign companies did not uh, strive to compete. But that said... Although they would say they haven't got any access. I mean, a lot of them don't have any access. It's just a fact. That's certainly true of Facebook and Google. That's right. Information related. Um, eBay competed with Alibaba. Amazon is still there, um, but they're outcompeted by JD. But that, I have to say, that landscape is shifting as well um, because of the new sector, the internet economy. There's just much more level playing field, much more competition. It might not have been the, the same kind of environment in the past when we're talking about automobile manufacturing competition. Malcolm, what do you think? I mean, I want to go back to Martin's point about the blocked transition. Do you think there's a sense in the West that they're kind of looking at China and thinking, well, you know, the carrot's not looking that great anymore, so maybe we'll treat them as an enemy now because well, we can wield a stick because there's nothing to gain? I, I think part of the Trump administration's attitude to Chinese trade, and indeed the view of people in a number of other Western countries, is sour grapes. I mean, the Chinese happen to have been very successful exporters. That's not a, a unique Asian phenomenon. We have went through exactly the same with Japan in the 1950s and with South Korea and other Asian countries. They've shown themselves to be able to produce the goods that we, our consumers, freely choose to buy because of quality, because of price, and all the other, other market considerations. So that aspect of it is sour grapes. And I don't go along with the, the, the Trump rhetoric or the Trump analysis. However, and there's a huge however, because what China has done so far, and in a sense you almost acknowledged it, if I may say so, is that they've taken the benefits of the global economy without responding. You yourself said it's now time to give something back. And by saying that, you were acknowledging that that's what they have not been doing up till now. And what they have refused to do, in any real sense, apart from rhetoric, is to allow Western companies, but not just Western companies, other Asian companies as well, to have the same access to penetrating Chinese markets as they expect to have uh, when they proudly go to Davos and say we believe in globalization and we are now the champions of globalization now that Washington has given that up. Uh, at this moment in time, I hope that will change, but at this moment in time, the ability not just of American companies, but of companies from any country other than China to actually get into the Chinese market and compete with Chinese companies is severely restricted, not just because of consumer choice in China, but because the Chinese government want it that way. And Ko, do you agree with that? In fact, when China joined the WTO, the, 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 one of the uh, conditions were to have certain sectors be open up to com foreign competition. And foreign companies wanted to come in for the Chinese market. And some even voluntarily traded in some of their key technologies. Now, that said, those are not the best companies in the world because they wanted the Chinese market. So that's, that's uh, inaccurate to say that there was uh, no foreign access whatsoever. There were certain sectors. Now, today, um, financial sectors is being liberalized, and they're inviting the foreign institutions to come in, which will be good for China as well, because we need competition to fix the financial system problems. Those kind of regulations, those kind of relaxation of rules have already happened. It's already been completed. So we're seeing that, um, you know, Tesla is the first foreign wholly owned uh, car company in China. Uh, and so we're hoping to see more change. Which is, which is puzzling then, the, quest, the, the, the kind of um, language out of Washington, D.C., the trade war language, because if things were changing fundamentally, why would the corporate lobby in the US not be fighting Trump every step of the way and saying, look, the door's open, we don't have a problem here, we're happy, we're getting the business that we need? In fairness, the trade war has accelerated the opening up of China, which includes not only financial services, but also lowering tariffs so that Chinese can import more from abroad. Now, this is a very important event that China recorded the first current account deficit in decades. It's gonna import more than it exports, and it will serve as a great source of aggregate demand. But 
it's Trump, the, the trade war can almost be say, said as thought of as a strategic gift because it's pushing for greater reforms, domestic reforms, as well as more opening up. And it's actually consistent with the long-term economic goals of China. Okay, Martin, can I just say, does that turn your argument on its head that you actually need to treat China a little bit as a foe or talk to it fairly firmly in order to get anything done? We can, so the first point is that we can get through lots and lots of different examples, and I think there's very substantial faults on both sides, certainly including China. We can go through uh, the details. But it seems to me absolutely clear there are two ways of approaching this. So let's not go. One way which senior Chinese policymakers I've spoken to are very enthusiastic about, which is force us to open up. This was a policy we adopted towards Japan, worked pretty well. And essentially there are two dominant areas here. A liberal, liberalization of access. The WTO deal was quite liberal at the time, but it left China as a developing country. That clearly makes less sense now. F f open access. Um, open access for direct investment and better protection of intellectual property. Those are sort of dominant Western concerns. And there's no doubt, if you talk to businesses extensively, and I have, that these are legitimate concerns. And there are important elements in the Chinese government, not necessarily the whole system, which is huge, that want to concede on that. However, it's not at all clear, if you start looking at the Western side, that's what they really want. This is what the corporate sector wants. There's no doubt that's what they want. Mr. Trump just wants trade to be balanced. But there is very important elements in the US in particular that want to disintegrate the economy from, with China, to bring the supply chains back to America, to stop Western companies actually investing in China. That's not what they want at all. They want it to be locked out. And the best indication of that, of course, is, though there are real issues here, is the hysteria about Huawei. That's just a very important thing. And another indicator is that it's becoming seriously difficult for Chinese companies to buy Western companies now. We say that they have obstacles to us. Well, we sure are creating obstacles for them. So we have to decide in a way we have to decide, do we want to open up China, which is probably in their interest and probably make them more competitive and increase our integration with them and a mutual interest, that's what I think we should be doing, or do we want to actually lock them out, in which case we guarantee hostility. And the, the Americans in particular haven't decided and the Europeans have no idea what their policy on this is at all. So the Western side is a complete mess. But if I understand you correctly, you're saying that it is in some people's interest in the West to say foe. Yes. Of Even course. if the objective reality out there uh, in China is not so you, you are, You are asking about why the is. American corporate lobby is not opposing China, uh, White House <clears throat> Trump policy more effectively. That's because half of the American corporate people uh, don't want imports into America. They want, to, uh, they want to have tariffs because it will give them the opportunity to sell directly to the American public. Uncompetitive producers are quite excited about this. So the, the, we have to decide our strategic view of our futures and the extent to which that depends on greater economic integration with China. The only difference I would make, everything Malcolm said about the comparisons with other Asian economies is of course important, but China is 10 times as big as Japan. So of course deciding to integrate with China, which I think is the right decision to make in the right terms, we can discuss that, is a massive strategic decision of a different order from the decision to integrate okay, with well Japan. Let's, let's take that, the whole discussion one step into security now, which is obviously related, and you raise Huawei. Malcolm, I want to put it to you. I mean, you've obviously worked on this, your committee, when you were on the Security and Intelligence um, Committee, produced a report on Huawei in the UK telecoms sector. Is it a threat, Huawei? Well, the United Kingdom's in a unique situation because when Huawei and British Telecom uh, worked together because of the concerns about security, the British government insisted and the Chinese company, presumably with the consent of their government, agreed to set up what was called a cell 
which is paid for by Huawei, but manned by effectively British intelligence officials, which constantly, every day, monitors the way in which Huawei is using its powers in relation to British Telecom, and whether it's abusing these powers in any way. Now, there is some doubt as to how effective that might be, but my own view is that the problem about whether it's Huawei or other Chinese companies is not so much these companies themselves. Uh, the fundamental problem uh, is because they are Chinese companies, under Chinese law, they would have to accept instructions from the Chinese government uh, as to how they operate. I just looked uh, today at that there's a new national intelligence law the Chinese passed a couple of years ago, and they're quite open about it. Uh, let me just read one sentence, what they say. Article 14 of this law grants intelligence agencies uh, uh, intelligence agencies, when legally carrying forth their intelligence work, may demand that concerted organs, organizations, or citizens provide need, uh, support, and assistance. So what that is, means is that if Huawei even didn't want to uh, abuse their power in the UK or the, uh, any other country, if they were instructed by Chinese intelligence, i.e. the Chinese government, they would have no legal right to refuse to cooperate. What and that say, is the concern. What do you say to the, to the argument from some quarters that this is just hypocrisy on the part of the West? That, that, that frankly, if you mention Edward Snowden, if you look sure, at some sure. of what the US okay. does, it's just the same. No, let me deal with that point actor. directly. No, no, let me deal with that point directly. Uh, if, for example, the British government tried to instruct British uh, Petroleum or British Telecom or any British company uh, to actually uh, interfere with their technology in other countries in order to meet the requirements of intelligence agencies, British companies would refuse to do that because there is no legal basis on which such an instruction could be issued. What you're referring to is something quite different. It's controversial, but it's quite different. It is the right in every country in the world uh, for intelligence agencies, if they get in a democracy, authority from the government, they can then require uh, the uh, servers the people who service the emails and the voicemails and so forth, uh, if there is evidence of terrorist planning or other threats to national security to share that information. That's limited to people who are servicing the information technology world. The Chinese law applies to every Chinese citizen, every Chinese company, regardless of whether these companies are involved in intelligence matters themselves. How you, what do you think of this? Is this a, a, a profound problem? Well, I, I've been looking into, looking into the cases against Huawei, uh, substantive evidence. You know, there's not much there. Uh, so uh, based on that, it's hard to really pinpoint um, the issue. Forgive me interrupting. It's, it's not so much, I agree with you. There's no evidence that Huawei up till now have abused their power. The question is, what would happen if the Chinese government, which has such legal control under Chinese law, instructed Huawei uh, or any other Chinese company uh, involved with the uh, uh, inf uh, information infrastructure or indeed uh, very complicated systems dealing with part of our critical national infrastructure to put in uh, access that would provide information. Now, the Chinese companies cannot refuse I, I, so the under U their own law. I, I believe that the U.S. government also exercises yeah. a greater political control over companies like Cisco, which, to which uh, China feels uh, equally vulnerable. But I think the real problem is, don't we have a global vacuum, a vacuum of global governance on cybersecurity, which is really a global issue. It's not just one company per se. Martin, do you think this is a, a, a global issue? Is this a, you know, big powers, Thucydides trap kind of one big power versus another? I'm going to control this realm. No, you're not. I'm going to control it. I'm used to controlling it. What do you think is going on here? Well, the big side, the, the, the Graham Allison argument, the big picture story is um, very simple and it doesn't depend on all these niceties. We should come to the niceties in a moment. But essentially what he's saying is if you have two great powers, um, uh, neither of which will be prepared to accede primacy to the other willingly, um, and uh, particularly, but not necessarily, it's not necessary, but it's probably made a little bit more difficult if they, fee they can credibly present the other to their own people as other, different, 
uh, you know, Sparta and Athens was his example, of course, in Thucydides' case, both Greek cities but very different, that sheer suspicion will create a cycle of tension which will lead to war. The classic modern example is the tensions, relatively modern compared to ancient Greece, is the tensions between uh, Britain and Germany before the First World War. And this wasn't essentially ideological. It wasn't like the Cold War. It doesn't depend on it, though it might be a factor. So Graham's argument would be that as China rises, conflict is inevitable, and so he would point to the, the election of Trump and the way the Trump administration is talking, the sort of speech uh, Vice President um, Mike Pence gave last year, which I've commented on at length, all indicate, ah, we found the enemy. Now, the truth is that so far, as has been pointed out, China has not responded for all sorts of reasons in that way, but it might be just biding its time, Graham would say. So the, the argument is, we're gonna go to war. Now that seems to me a colossally horrendous way of thinking about the future, and he would agree. So then you have to come to specific issues and specific complaints and manage them. That's the point I made right at the beginning. So the issue of cybersecurity is a first class issue and it will have to be managed. There is a very strong sense in the West that China is a massive state promoter of cyber espionage across the board. And of course, China feels the same about us. I have no idea of the truth of this. I'm not an expert, but it's something that has to be dealt with. Um, similarly, of course, all the naval issues connected to the South China Sea, and all that, these are issues that have to be managed. Uh, issues about intellectual property have to be managed. Issues about state-directed espionage have to be managed. So what we're going to have to do, I think, is create, if we don't want to go down the Thucydides trap way, and it's pretty obvious to me that will be insane, just think what it means, that we have to devise ways of cooperating effectively. And that means, of course, admitting the real differences we have, what and where, how to handle them. It will involve global regimes, oversight, and all the rest of it, and changes in law. Now, that will also be required. I think Malcolm's points are important. That's what we're going to have to do. Will that be easy? No. But the alternative is where we are now, which I think will lead fairly soon, and I really am serious about it, fairly soon to a pretty well complete breakdown of relations between the US and China, and that will be a very serious when threat for the world. When you say soon, what's, what's the next the few years? Uh, I think you've got to get this in proportion. Uh, what we're discussing at this part of this evening uh, is not the general question of trade between China and other countries. We're talking about a very specific area of Chinese companies that are tendering for contracts in what is called the critical national infrastructure. Well, that's one aspect. When we were looking at security issues, so I'm happy with the, the, the wide-ranging discussion of the Thucydides no. trap, but I'm very no. happy to come back no, no. to you putting the, it in the yeah, perspective yeah, sure. of... So we're talking about... Which means, do you, is it wise to allow foreign companies to be actually involved in the computer systems that will control our nuclear power stations, for answer? example? Well, the answer is, first of all, it depends which country they come from. It depends, secondly, whether these companies could be instructed, as Chinese companies can, by their government to involve themselves in political interference. And for example, in Britain, there is no such law, I have to say, that would allow any British government to instruct a British company uh, operating in China uh, to uh, interfere with systems in order to meet the political requirements of the British government. That would be illegal under British law and under Chinese law, uh, it seems to be something which is permitted. So you've got to have a strategy which has been developed quite substantially in Britain and in other countries, not just to prevent that happening, but also to ensure that you have resilience when there is interference, that you don't have the destruction of some of your vital public services. So on, on the vital public services, 5G networks, the, the question of the hour, and the United States, Australia, New Zealand, basically deciding against having Huawei inside them. What is your view about where the UK should stand on that? Well, the United Kingdom's in a unique situation for the reasons I briefly mentioned a few moments ago, because whether we like it or not, while we are already involved in our critical national infrastructure through their relationship with British Telecom. And the question is whether the particular uh, compromise that the British government forced on the Chinese, and to be fair to Huawei, they accepted it, they pay for it, is this daily monitoring system 
The tra now, it depends on the advice that the intelligence agencies are giving in Britain, GCHQ in particular, are they able to say to the British government, we are comfortable with the way this monitoring system is working, or are we not? But and the evidence the that came out recently was that, broadly speaking, they are comfortable, but they cannot give the degree of assurance they would like to. But that is that, at the end of the day, the conversation? Because if you're the United States, don't you come to the UK, and you've been the Foreign Secretary and Defence Secretary, so you know the answer to this better than I do. Doesn't the US just come to the London and say, are you or are you not our closest ally? We don't think you should have Huawei in your 5G network. Why is it still? Why are you still talking to well, them? Well, this is because we are an ally. We're not a subject of the United no, States. I, we uh, make our own decisions. But it is a factor uh, in, your, on, in your strategic alliances, uh, isn't course, it? Of course, of course. And you know, if we were not already involved with Huawei, this is a historical fact, which doesn't apply in Australia or New Zealand or the United States. If if we didn't have Huawei at the moment, the likelihood is that the British government's view would be not that different to other Western countries. But we're dealing with a given at the moment. And there, you remember, there, there are very few other companies from, in the Western world that can provide some of the technology that Huawei can provide. So you, that is also a constraint when you decide, do you have to take some level of risk or, or can you eliminate all risk entirely? And while we're just dealing with these security questions, I want to deal with, very quickly with two further questions, one of which, in a way, does relate directly to this. If you are, if you, if the decision of the UK is to go ahead with Huawei inside 5G, and then we have a South China Sea problem, because all these security issues are, at the end of the day, potentially related. I mean, we've seen that China sees some things as related. The Chancellor of Exchequer is no longer going to China for his visit on trade, as a result of Gavin Williams and the Defence Secretary's comments on sending uh, an that, aircraft. That's there. a temporary spat. That, that, that is not a fundamental change either by the Chinese Except or by the British. Except that if something dramatic did happen in the South China Sea or in Taiwan, or in, Taiwan in terms of military activities, yeah. that would create issues for the UK, well, wouldn't that it? Becomes very, that would be then very similar to what has happened with Russia because of their annexation of Crimea and their destabilization of eastern Ukraine. If a country like Russia or China or any other country acts in what is manifestly a hugely aggressive way towards their neighbors, then they suffer consequences. And in the modern world, they are more likely, thankfully, to be economic sanctions than going to war. We're not going to go to war with China, but uh, undoubtedly, if they act just as Russia did, there are consequences, not just for Britain or the United States. It depends on whether the international community is willing to respond in a combined way. And, and Ko Yu, can I bring you into this? Is there something that China can do on the bigger strategic stage in terms of security to reassure um, these partners that it is friend, not foe? I'm thinking, for example, North Korea. I mean, China, as we know, has a special relationship with North Korea. <laughs> Certainly, it's got a more special relationship than anyone else. Um, can it do something to leverage that relationship to show that it is being the global player that is cooperative, that does want to resolve security problems in a way that works for everybody? Um, so, first of all, let me just say briefly uh, to, to set this stage right, China's state opposes um, openly opposes state-led um, uh, espionage. They have made a lot of progress with President Xi and Obama. That was stalled because of the rising tension. So this requires greater governance on a global scale. The problem is the trust issue. The problem is the trust issue, but I think we should be more transparent uh, on dealing with these issues. Um, the, you know, the, the, the regional, uh, yes, China is a big, a big country. It will exert greater influence in the region, hopefully in a positive way. Hopefully it will learn how to uh, you know, develop a certain kind of soft power in order to reassure that its influence in the, in the re uh, region is about economic cooperation. South China Sea, yes, there are disputes. There are, have been, it's a historical thing coming from 19th century of the territorial disputes. Right now, China's stance is let's develop the area uh, together. And on North Korea, we have seen that they have really stepped up on uh, pushing North Korea, pressuring North Korea, including economic sanctions, when it was necessary to do so. But let me just say that this is a learning curve for China. It's the first time that China is engaging in the world in this fashion without the experience and um, history of many, let's say, European countries or the Western powers and their experience in dealing with other countries. It's the first time, so it's on a steep learning curve. And you raised a very important issue, which um, there are so many aspects of this, technical aspects, intensely political, intensely economic. But if I'm right that we are moving towards a world 
in which uh, the US establishment is moving, is itself moving towards a more profoundly hostile or at least adversary relationship with China, which will be long lasting. And I think it's what's happening. I don't think it's just this administration. They are not only going to, they are coming to Europe and saying, so whose side are you on? And that of course will include the UK, even though we are semi or soon to be completely detached from the EU, but we're still in the NATO structure, so we'll be part of that. And I think Europeans, including ourselves, will have to work out whether we want to be in this new Cold War with the same sort of relationship that we had during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. Different situation because geographically we're of course a long way away and all the rest of it, but economically, Europe is an enormous partner of China, in many ways more important than the US, and it could be forced to take a fairly difficult position. And let me remind you, the US view of what is national security, though I'm not denying what Margaret said, goes way beyond Huawei. Just get your mind around the fact that the Americans seem to be about to declare the German car industry a mortal threat to US national security. Once you've gone there, there's really pretty well nothing that can't be included in this, in so the, this umbrella. Almost and, as broad as the Chinese and umbrella. And so the Europeans are better decided where they want to be and how. So, so move, I want to move the discussion on to our third part because uh, otherwise we won't get to it. And, and in a way it relates to this. In a choice, in a, in a them or us choice that um, the US force may force on its allies or China may force on its partners, um, would it be easier? Would the choice feel narrower? Would the choice be mitigated if our values were closer? with China? Is there a growing divergence between values which makes that them or us issue feel more um, urgent and hard? Malcolm. Well, let me illustrate in my response something that I experienced myself. When I was Foreign Secretary, you mentioned I was involved in the final stage of the Hong Kong negotiations with China. And I remember going to Beijing to see the Chinese Foreign Minister. And I went through Hong Kong on my way there. And the people of Hong Kong said, when you see the Chinese Foreign Minister, will you please tell them that when we become part of China, what we're anxious about is not just will we be able to vote for more than one political party in an election. What is perhaps even more important is will we continue to enjoy the rule of law. Now, we all know what that means. It's about you know, having an independent judiciary, judges, the government under the law, and so forth. When I saw the Chinese Foreign Minister, I passed on this message I've been asked to give. Chen Chi Chen, and I've never forgotten his reply. He said, oh, don't worry, Mr. Rifkind. We in China, we too believe in the rule of law. In China, the people must obey the law. <laughs> and I said, now hold on a moment. When we talk about the rule of law, it's not just the people who must obey the law. It's the government must be under the law. If its government's doing something illegal, they must respect the right of courts to instruct them to stop doing it. And it works like that. You know, he not only didn't agree with me, he hadn't the faintest idea what I was talking about. <laughs> And it's been summed up rather well, and this is not what the expression I'm going to use is not mine, but I think it's perfect. It, 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 when you're dealing with dictatorships, whether it's China or Mr. Putin in Russia, they don't have the rule of law, they have rule by law. They use the law in order to entrench their own political power as we are seeing sadly in Xinjiang, the western province of China, uh, where we're told the law permits the Chinese government to incarcerate perhaps hundreds of thousands of uh, Muslims in that part of China. Now that's not rule of law, that's rule by law. And exactly the same way the Chinese government refused to allow their own people to have proper access to the internet. It is more censored comprehensively. You cannot put in uh, uh, anything into the internet in China uh, that is uh, disapproved of. So if you ask about uh, what happened in Tianmin Square, it's blocked. So, now, that is something which makes the relationship between China and the wider world, not just with the West. These sort of constraints don't exist in virtually every other continent of the world, including Africa, Latin America, and most of Asia. And so until China realizes that its limitations on its own people's liberty is so restrictive, uh, so unusual in the modern world, 
How can China expect to be trusted and treated as an equal partner, as it deserves to be by virtue of its culture and its history and its size and its importance? Uh, Kai, you as well. I mean, if you can deal with some of that. And also, I mean, I suppose, I mean, one of the things that's noticeable about Xi Jinping's era um, in power has been the, a growing tendency to talk about the West as if it's a foe, a US-led conspiracy, locking up human rights lawyers, saying that they are you know, agents of foreign powers, color revolution allegations, that kind of thing. The Xinjiang problem, um, Christian leaders talking about it being a worse time than since the culture at any time they can remember since the Cultural Revolution. It is puzzling on the face of it, isn't it, that China, this growing confident power, is moving backwards in some of these respects. I think that the hope for China is the younger generation. In fact, 80% of the youth in the whole of China is online. They imbibe information uh, for a living. With regard to information sensitivity, all you need to download is one little click and you get Google. Um, not everybody uses that. They like Baidu, fine, Baidu has uh, done a lot. Um, half a million of these, uh, these uh, younger generation um, go uh, study abroad uh, every year, and it's increasing by the numbers. Um, so they are very much about open exchange, and I've looked at surveys. Their attitude towards the West is much more optimistic and much more open than even con consider, you know, comparing uh, people, those who are born in the 70s or 60s. Uh, they believe in horizontal networks, not vertical hierarchies. They do not need political connections to do their business and become entrepreneurs. They don't need the local licenses and local land. That is really changing the landscape of China. And what, what's happening today is so dangerous, setting into the mindset of these younger generation, uh, nationalist, nationalistic, um, uh, you know, a kind of rivalry, that kind of uh, win, uh, sorry, uh, kind of, uh, you know, lose-lose kind of situation is changing their perception. And I have been very hopeful, and we talk about the younger generation, but they're post-80s, post-90s, they will become China's leader in about 10 years' time. But what is happening today is changing that perception. And I think that is dangerous. What is happening on the ground is a bit different uh, from, uh, you know, the realistic the micro channels, the WeChats, the kind of uh, micro blogging, there is a lot of information exchange going on. In fact, you can look at President Xi's, how careful President Xi is treading this US China relationship. On the one hand, it has to respond to US, uh, to avoid an outright collision with the US and make certain kind of trade concessions. On the other hand, it has to face, he has to face the Chinese citizens. Are you just giving up China's interest? Um, so, if he was really completely un, uh, unrestrained, he can just do one, anything he so wants. So in answer to some of the problems, religion, um, Uyghurs incarcerated in so-called vocational training centers, um, you know, Christians free to worship, young people free to use Google rather than having to do it secretly and risking prosecution. Do you think in 10 years' time, all of that will have changed in China? That China will be politically a much more open place so that that them or us choice will feel much narrower ideologically? Um, the current administration uh, believes that China is in a transition period. Rightfully or wrongfully, I'm not gonna judge. Um, social stability is a huge concern. The Chinese people want security and they want stability. There is potentially a cost to that. Uh, there is always a spectrum between freedom and, and stability, and where are you exactly on that spectrum? Uh, different countries may choose. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, uh, where we're going in terms of being deeply embedded in the global network, be, being very much involved in the global uh, technology space, I mean, think about how dynamic that's happening right now, the innovations that are going on, uh, the entrepreneurial activities, the enthusiasm, People are doing what they're doing. They respond to incentives. That's why these Chinese companies are successful. Are we moving towards a greater, more open society? I'm gonna hope and bet on the Chinese new generation. Martin, um, I mean, we've heard mention of the, of the cyber issue. In terms of tech, do you think the Chinese Communist Party is going to be able to restrain itself from perfecting repression through tech and actually opening up in the way that Koyu's given as a vision yes, of. We haven't even talked about the social credit system, which is well, one exactly. of the main Western, uh, um, Western concerns. I think, first of all, I wouldn't regard myself compared certainly with some of the people here, uh, as in any way an expert on China's 
political and social systems, uh, it would be ridiculous for me to pretend I do. Westerners are not going to like it, and I don't. Right? It's pretty clear. Uh, it, it is a, a, a repressive single party dictatorship. To be absolutely clear, and I don't like it. But that's not relevant whether I do. The question is whether one can deal with this in a sensible and productive way, and in a way which gives some chance that it will move in a more liberal direction in the long term. No more than that. It is perfectly possible it seems to me that with new, techno new technology we can see very clearly is a double-edged weapon. It liberates and oppresses at the same time. It gives room for oppression as well as room for liberation. And we simply have no idea how that's going to play out, by the way, not only in China but in other parts of the world. I won't illustrate that. So clearly you can tell a story, that you can tell a story in which China ends up as the perfect Orwellian state without the boot, as it were. That's the point. That will be very, very, very depressing. But we're not going to determine that. They're going to determine that. Uh, we, China isn't ours, it's theirs. The question is, here, the question to me is this. Here we have this enormous power, which is not going away, and with which we in the world are going to have to cooperate and deal to solve a lot of problems we care about. One of the problems that was discussed was climate, which I take very, very seriously. We're not going to begin to deal with it without talking to them. So the question is, how do we deal with them? Realistically, is my view. So we have to understand where there are threat points for us. Um, free speech of people in our societies matters to us. So we really want to be quite clear that that is defended and protected. Um, uh, Espionage is a very serious issue. We have to look at that very carefully. But my view remains very strongly that in the long run, we are more likely to get, or less unlikely, I don't know how, to get a China that we will feel comfortable with and our children and grandchildren will feel comfortable with if we are open, fair, reasonable, in dealing with it and not paranoid and crazy. And some of what is going on, I have no doubt, is paranoid and crazy. So, uh, and none of that rules out the obvious fact. There are lots of things going on in China, also in other countries, but in China, which I think are very, very concerning. And it may turn out that 10 or 15 years from now, we do have ended up with a country which is so hostile, we can't deal with it. But at least I would like to feel we haven't created that by our own stupidity. And I think we are moving in that direction. Just one short point, if I may. Um, what happens within China, ultimately, is not our business in a direct sense. It's for the Chinese people to either live with or react against the denial of freedom to them. What is our business is Chinese foreign policy and the way it treats its neighbors. And like all great powers, and I don't just single out China here, when you're a superpower, you have a great temptation to bully your neighbors mm -hmm. because you have a leverage that they do not have. The British Empire did it when we were the superpower. The United States has been doing it for the last 100 years. Uh, and China is now doing it in the South China Sea in particular, but also elsewhere. That the world can live with. It's when a country goes beyond that, as you mentioned Germany before the First World War, it's when it actually goes beyond just trying to bully its neighbors and tries to impose its will uh, against the wider international community, then you could be in a crisis situation. But now, we're, we're, nowhere, we're, we're not, not there at the moment. We're not seeing that yet I, at I, all. I, 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 Our I, paranoia I, is more likely to create that, I, I agree think. with you, but the more the Chinese government destabilizes, I mean, what we've seen, for example, is India, and Japan, for the first time in their history, having joint naval exercises. Why? Because they both perceive a common threat from China. Now, that is very disturbing for China as it is for the whole of Asia and indirectly for the wider world. Let's hear now from the floor. It's time to get some questions from all of you. Um, China, friend, foe, fact of life to deal with fairly. I see a what? Let's take a question there first and then. Um, up here and then up there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> if the Chinese are putting indignant pressure on us, on the one hand, to let Huawei come into our markets, 
And on the other hand, the satellite evidence is pretty clear they've locked up a million people in the Uyghur provinces with no trial. What realistic foreign policy pressures can we exert on them uh, to change? Thanks, what, what can we do? Okay. And that one? We'll take, we'll take um, three at a time and then just get the answers yep. to all Thank of them. Thank you very much. Um, is there an aspect, if you like, of a sort of clash of cultures, a clash of civilizations? Um, if you look at sort of Chinese philosophy, particularly Sun Tzu's The Art of War, for example, he strongly, strongly argues against using direct military force. It's much more about espionage. It's much more about using diplomacy as a term of warfare. Are we seeing that sort of China's actions are based, if you like, on their history, if you like. You know, um, the Ming, the Qing dynasties did the same. They didn't send out colonies into Southeast Asia, but they did um, sort of have tribute states all around them. Now, is this a rational Chinese policy that you, know, you can see from the past and that we in the West are reacting very badly to because we don't understand them? Or are they actually much more aggressive than they are actually trying to expand outwards? Thank you. And the third. Oh, yes, up there. Um, I, you've talked a lot about the West in very general terms, and I wondered if you could bring it back to the UK more specifically, because I've got some 150 entry stamps into China, and what I find in China is an enormous interest for and affection for the UK. And I wondered whether we can't be a bit more proactive in what we do, particularly with a very adversarial US-China relationship. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those three. Let's, let's um, take, well, let's take the foreign policy question. The first question first to you, Malcolm. What can you do if Huawei are inside your system and then if millions of, well, not millions at this point, but if hundreds of thousands possibly are locked up in, in Xinjiang, what tools of foreign policy do you have? I, I don't think it's realistic to suggest that by blocking Huawei, that will make an impact on China, Chinese government's policy towards its citizens in Xinjiang. I mean, the two are separate issues, and it's a mistake to, I think, try and combine them. But uh, what the Chinese clearly are sensitive to uh, is global opinion directed against their own actions. Now, until very recently, one of the most disturbing things about the reaction to the uh, incarceration of many Chinese Muslims in Xinjiang, purely because of their Muslim uh, background, was the almost total silence from Muslim countries. Turkey's now obviously stepped Turkey up. Turkey has now been the first country, for whatever reason, to very strongly criticize and condemn. And the problem that we've had, and when I say we, the international community has had, is that many of the Muslim states are close to China physically, are able to be bullied by China, do not dare antagonize China, and therefore the Chinese have been able to create, the government have been able to create the impression this is all simply Western criticism. I think this is a, a unique uh, example of where the main impact on Chinese government policy will come not by the reaction of the United States or the United Kingdom, which is already there, but which they in a sense they can ignore, but when the Muslim world makes the kind of protests against China. Can you imagine if this was happening in Britain, that we were incarcerating uh, hundred, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or in, in the United States or in France or in Germany, uh, the reaction there would be from the Muslim world. By I say the Muslim world, I mean Muslim states, governments. Uh, and uh, with the, all credit to Turkey that they have broken ranks and have now condemned China, if they were accompanied by all the countries of the Arab world, by Indonesia, by Pakistan, by other countries in the same way, China would be forced to change its policy. Can you, can you tackle the second question, this question of whether Chinese foreign policy is coming out of deep own history? And so when we kind of categorize it as friend or foe, we are using our own value judgments and we may misjudge because we don't understand China's history of foreign policy. I think that one does have to study a bit more uh, Chinese history and world history for that matter. I think if anything, compared to all the great powers that have risen, China's rise is really quite relatively peaceful. Um, in respect to uh, the history, China sets tributary relationship with the neighbors uh, in, uh, tra in you know, exchange for security uh, or protection, uh, a submission of that kind of relationships. It didn't go around and conquer and colonize everybody. 
um, uh, unlike others. So, um, but, but today, if I may say, um, China is not trying to export values. It's not trying to export moral universalism. It's not trying really to export development model because, in fact, it says this development model doesn't suit most other countries. It never said this. You guys should take up and emulate this kind of development model. In thinking about a Chinese global leadership, it emphasizes on allowing for differences because when you impose convergence of values of systems. That creates problems, and we have seen much of that. Now, that doesn't mean that it should countenance every kind of regime, every kind of situation. That is not the case. But it does allow for religious differences and different kind of ideologies, because ideology is to be ideologically free. Thank you. And Martin, can you take the third question? Is, is the UK in a, in a special position here? Can it offer something to help? Um. So much like to comment on the other two, but I'll be disciplined. Um, the the um, such fascinating questions. I think that I have a very specific point, which I think addresses that in a way I've made it, so I can make it fairly briefly. I believe, for reasons I've explained, that it is quite likely, not certain, but quite likely, that our great ally, the U.S is moving towards a contained China policy. And there are lots of very serious West American policy intellectuals, not Republicans, arguing for this. And, um, and that is an across the board containment policy uh, in all the eight dimensions uh, that we are concerned. And taking, being cognizant of our own interests, which is that we're a moderate-sized nation for which the US is a crucial and decisive ally, which is decided for reasons I will never understand, but perhaps people do understand, to cast itself loose from Europe. So cognizant of those realities, I think the UK should not go along with this policy. So far as it can, it should avoid and be clear that it avoids being uh, the little frigate following the battleship in this endless, because it will be endless, confrontation with China, which could um, shape our world in a really horrible way. So that's a fairly specific thing. And when you talk about that, that of course has implications for how we conduct our economic policy, our foreign policy, how we operate in the WTO, and all the other things. We should ally ourselves with the US where there are clear, concrete interests which will be served, but we should not go along with any broad attempt to recreate in relationship to China the policies we had towards the Soviet Union because, for reasons already explained, I think the two cases are totally different. I, I agree with the substance of what Martin has said. It would be ridiculous to suggest that China today poses the kind of threat to the West uh, that the Soviet Union during the Cold War, if it had not been uh, faced up to, uh, indeed would have uh, acted. So that, it is not a comparator. But we do not yet know how China is going to use the new power that it now has. And the, the early signs are disturbing because the early signs, and I don't just mean in relation to the South China Sea, well, forgive me, they, you indicated that uh, China said everyone should benefit from the South China Sea. The fact is that China has a monopoly of, has taken a monopoly of control of many of these small islands and has built a military base on one of the most important of them so that it will totally dominate through its naval forces uh, that area. That is disturbing. It is now also being much more belligerent in relation to Taiwan, uh, and making it clear that if the Taiwanese in any way uh, seek to have an aspiration of controlling their own destiny, that is unacceptable to China, and that China would use military force, Xi Jinping's words, not mine, uh, to stop them doing that. That is very disturbing. They have territorial disputes with Japan, with the Philippines, 
and with virtually every other one of their neighbours, not to mention India, on the other side of their border. So, Mark, so that's is, pretty disturbing stuff. Is your stuff. strategic point that, you know, while, while hearing everything Martin said, that the frigate should be at the ready to, to, to get in behind the mothership of the US? Well, I don't think at this stage the problems of China, uh, I, I, the threat is to either Western Europe or indeed to the United States in the political sense. I think the main threat of China at the moment actually is to its neighbors, to its Asian neighbors. I mentioned earlier, India and Japan cooperating for the first time in history because they see a common threat. Now, what we are talking about, India and, and the Asian countries have said we're no longer talking about uh, a, a, a Pacific policy and an Indian Ocean policy. It is now Indo-Pacific. The countries that surround China are seeking to contain China and they will have the support of the United States Navy. Uh, what Europe does is relatively insignificant because we do not have the military capability in the Far East uh, that would make a profound difference. So we are in the relatively privileged position of not having to make a final black and white them and us choice as early as other people. Well, it would be premature anyway because yeah. we still are entitled to hope that China, although it's entitled to be uh, far more influential than it's ever been in the last 100 years. It's entitled to that by virtue of its economic strength and its uh, political significance. Uh, but we do not yet know whether it's going to exaggerate its ability to dominate its neighbors or whether it's going to respect the fact that power should not always be exercised to the absolute uh, extremities of what it, it, it in theory you. has. In Let's trade listen. and economics, Europe is very big. Yes, that's true. What you say on security is right, but on trade and economics, yeah, Europe is very big. Let's take some more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you briefly touched on like the different values and the different system between the West and China. Let's just assume China will become continue to be a dictatorship and Western is continue to be democratic. And let's assume China doesn't exert their power excessively to their neighbors, just state controlled. Do you still think Western world can to some can, work with China in terms of develop um, economies and trade and globalization. Well, it seems like Western world likes to impose their democratic systems. It seems like everyone should be kind of follow the same system. But is that a right way to say, are we allowing different systems for different countries and you can still work together with different systems? Thank you. Great. In China, you can't go onto the internet and buy a Bible, you can't go to a church unless it happens to be a state-controlled registered one. What is to be done about the fact that China is denying its own citizens basic human rights like freedom of religion and freedom of association? Thank you. And the third one, it was up there. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Martin about his point about the containment of China or integration of China from the perspective of the UK. Uh, just as um, you know, when a small company is uh, merged with a large company, it's not really a merger but a takeover. Um, is it not true that in, in the relationship between sovereign nations, when a, a, a large sovereign nation is integrated with a small sovereign nation, it's not really an integration? but a relationship of master and servant. And is that not the situation that would apply between the UK and China if the integration that he's talking about were to occur? Thank you. And a fourth. Yes, thank you. Um, don't you think that after Brexit and the um, perhaps disintegration of trade between Europe and uh, the UK, it's only right that rather than complaining about things that will probably never be able to change in China, instead focus on a pragmatic relationship and realise that the best way to cooperate with China is to increase trade rather than try to focus on their domestic policy, which we won't be able to influence. Okay, thank you. So those, the, let's um, divide up those four. Malcolm, can you take the, the, the first one? Why are we trying to impose values on China? Why don't we just accept that China is the way it is, we're the way we are, and just get on with it? Well, first of all, we're not trying to impose values on China. We couldn't succeed even if we did want to do that. The Chinese people will either demand these rights or they will not. Uh, what I would take exception to is saying that the choice is between the Chinese system or what the questioner referred to as Western values, which implies that because democracy and the rule of law originated uh, in, as it were, the Mediterranean, that somehow they're not relevant to the rest of the world. Well, if that was true, you would not have most of Asia 
applying the same rule of law and democratic systems, not identical, but comparable uh, to the West. And just think of China's own neighbors, uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, uh, India. Uh, these are all not Western countries, but they, their peoples have chosen and worked successfully to implement uh, what this questioner called Western values. They're not universal values. Uh, it is no more right to say you can't have democracy in China because democracy was invented in Greece uh, than to say you can't have uh, Islam in Asia because it was invented in the Holy Land. You know, or, or Christianity was invented in Palestine, therefore it's not relevant to any other part of the world. It's an absurd argument. And the same applies to democracy and the rule of law. These are not Western values, they're universal Thank values. You. And Ko you on the second one, Bibles in China, availability, why is it hard? Uh, well, I think the question was about religious freedom and human rights, and I think that absolutely religious freedom is a form of human rights, but human rights is also broadly measured in terms of access to education, access to um, health, um, the fact that hundreds of millions of people were lifted out of the poverty. As a young woman, you can walk down the streets in any city and feel safe. These are all part of human rights. And I completely agree, China's current challenge is what is the um, ethical code? What is the moral foundation of society given that religion, um, you know, the, the kind of Chinese philosophy was, the, was, uh, was underpinning this and that eroded over time. Uh, so now there's a lot of active, um, active uh, church activities going on underground. Um, that is not to say that the Western institutionalized religion is without problems. I think China is trying to find and encourage more um, uh, Buddhism and absolutely religious freedom is, is one of the aspect, but not the only one. And um, I hope to see change as well. Thank you. And Martin, a relationship of master-servant, is there a danger of that from your, your suggestions and advice? I think I can deal with the last two together, mm. though I'd be very happy because, in fact, they go together rather nicely, you cool. see, uh, because the pragmatic relationship would, under this hypothesis, be to become this, this slave. Yeah. Um, so I think the answer to that question is um, that a sensible country um, uh, tries to have, um, certainly one located where we are, to have very close, uh, prosperous and mutually beneficial relationship with lots and lots of countries, some of them bigger and some of them smaller. Um, and the likelihood is, if you look at our future, that we are going to end up very highly integrated, despite our best efforts, still with Europe, with the United States, which will remain a huge power, with China, with India, which we haven't mentioned, and many other countries. And if we are in the position that we can have good relationships economically with all of these countries, we won't be slaves to any of them. Uh, I know some people think we have been a slave to Brussels. I suspect not so many will think that a year or two from now. And do you, do you really think we've been a slave, to, a slave of the United States in the last 70 years? Maybe you do. But if you do think that, I don't think it'll be any worse with China. Uh, the, the crucial point is we're a country of 60 millions trying to do our best in the world and we cannot do whatever we like, nor we can we make everybody behave the way we think they ought to behave. And therefore I'm very definitely with the last questioner. The sensible way of looking at the future is pragmatic. I used to think the British were pragmatic. I've given up that idea. <laughs> We're going to take just one last round of questions, and in that idea of diversifying our, you know, where we place our security in every other aspect of ourselves, let's diversify. A hundred flowers bloom. I want to hear more from Chinese in the audience, please. I want to hear some Chinese voices and, and some more women. So I'm sorry, men, and I'm sorry if you're a white man, but if. <laughs> Um, so, if we've got a woman up there, um, that would be great. Um, and over here, yes. Yeah, so let's start. Let's start up there. Um, thank Hello. you. Hello. Uh, what do you think it will take for China to lead in climate change in a 
consistent and structural way. Thank you. Um, let's go to number one there. Um, why are the Chinese, despite being enormously successful and prosperous, some of the gloomiest people, according to um, a world happiness rankings, they rank 86 out of 150, which is right after Russia and a few war-torn war -torn countries. So I'd be interested to see why that's the case. Thank you. And yes, number three. Um, a really small question. We all know like China are now posting like the Belt and Road and also the investment in African countries. So, and I also know some commentators, they compare these um, foreign policy behaviors like the new Marshall Plan. So I want to ask your opinion about this opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to have to stop at three because we're running out of time. So. Uh, climate change, what will it take for China to lead constructively? Who'd like to pick that up? Let me just make one point on climate change, if I may. Um, the Chinese government denied that Beijing had a pollution problem until the Chinese public forced them to change that view. And it was curiously how it was done. The United States put on its embassy building um, uh, some equipment that could monitor the pollution levels in the atmosphere and announced each day what these pollution levels were. And it became compulsory for the whole of the population of Beijing to find out what these figures were. And eventually, the Chinese government surrendered and said, yep, OK, we have a terrible pollution problem, which they totally denied until then, implying it was no worse than anybody else's. And since then, my understanding, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, is that uh, significant improvements are now in place. Now, all credit, that was the Chinese public actually forcing the Chinese government, very rare, to do something they really didn't want to do. And that could be a very important precedent. Okay, is that how you see that? I mean, the, the, the question almost started from a position that China wasn't leading constructively on climate change, but actually for, in the beginning of this evening, you seem to be arguing that it, that it was. So can you give us your view on China and climate change leadership? Well, just look at the facts. I mean, half of the global investment every year on a renewable energy is undertaken by China. It's doing three times that of the US. Uh, uh, Malcolm is absolutely right. There has been a lot of improvement and the citizens have um, uh, played a huge role. I think that's progress. That means there is feedback and there's, the government has been accountable on that front. And it will continue to uh, lead in the renewable uh, energy industry uh, going forward. And uh, I'm going to ask you the question about gloom. Well, can I, can I answer the Belt and Road first? Because I think it's very important. There's a $90 billion uh, deficit in infrastructure in Africa every year. China is really the only realistic country to be able to support in helping that. It's up to the nations themselves how they're going to use this financial support. They could consume it and run into domestic debt crises, as many other developing countries have in the past, or they can invest it in infrastructure and human capital and spur uh, economic growth. So it's not just up to, the Chinese will be willing to provide that financial assistance, but it's also in the control just of the one Chinese. One brief point on that. I mean, so, one of the questioners mentioned, should it be an equivalent to the Marshall Plan? There's one fundamental difference. When the Americans launched Marshall Plan, they provided grants, not loans, that had to be repaid to the devastated countries of Europe. China's massive investment is on the basis of debt. And we have already seen at least a dozen recipients of that largesse now protesting. Uh, Malaysia is cancelling. Uh, Sri Lanka had to give uh, China 90 years leasehold of it, one of its naval ports because you couldn't afford it the debt. Malaysia changed the Well, their plans. Uh, this yeah. Pakistan, one of China's closest uh, allies, China's is saying we cannot off. afford. Why is it all done as debt and not as... We're going to have uh, to leave that question hanging. <laughs> Martin, I, you, were, you, were, you were nodding. I'm going to let you have one word on Belt and Road. When I say one word, you can have a sentence. <laughs> I wanted to know why Chinese people say they're so unhappy. Yeah, we're going to come uh, back to Koyu on um, that. <laughs> I would just say that their ranking on happiness is more or less their ranking on GDP per head. So maybe it's not so surprising. It's very, very important. We have missed this. Um, China is an enormous country, and it's therefore an enormous economy, but it's still a really quite poor country. It's not poor as it was, 
but its GDP per head in real terms is about a quarter of US levels, about a third of our levels. In other words, it's roughly where we were 60 or 70 years ago. So that's very important to remember. They think they're a developing country, and they're right. Hold that uh, thought. The, per you, is he right uh, on the gloom question? B the is BRI, that the answer to the... Uh, no, 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 the BRI on. is something that could be... The BRI could make a very big positive difference. At the moment, my view is we don't know whether it will. Thank you. Well, that was a very concise sentence. Yes, it was. Well done. <laughs> Can you gloom? Um, as much as we can trust surveys and relative uh, fri frames of mind, taken that as given, uh, but, you know, I come back to this. What is the spiritual foundation in the Chinese society? I do think that is a very important question. It can no longer, uh, for some period of time, it came from prosperity and attainment of material wealth. There has to be something else, and maybe that is what it's missing. In the younger generation, the one-child policy to which I was born, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of responsibilities to your elders. Who are you living for? Thank you. So, you, we, I'm going to... I'm sorry, I really can't take any more questions from all of you now because we've run out of time. I'm just going to ask one last question to the panel, which is really, I guess, where we started to bookend it. We said, you know, we look back and said five years ago it was golden era, it was win-win, um, all the language. Five years hence, where will we be? Martin, very briefly. <laughs> we will, I think be trying to work out a relationship, which isn't the naive, everything is going to be perfect forever, uh, view of perhaps 10, 15 years ago, but isn't, I hope at least, and I think probably won't be, China is actually the devil incarnate and the whole aim of life must be to suppress it. That is to say, we're going to behave in a really mature, sensible and grown up fashion. Now, do I believe that's likely? No, but that's what I hope for. <laughs> So you're going to go with the hope rather than the belief? Five years from now, we won't look as stupid as we do right now on either side. Kai, what do you think? Um, first, which American president will be around? Um, but I do believe there will be more uh, convergence than divergence. Malcolm. I think if we're trying to look years ahead, I think the most important thing is actually the potential relevance of Belt and Road to the relationship of Europe and China. Uh, Europe and China for a thousand years have had to have contact with each other by the sea lanes. The, that huge Central Asian landmass has been like the Atlantic Ocean. It was a barrier. What is happening now, and if we look 5, 10, 15 years ahead, uh, already freight trains are going from China to Western Europe every week in, in increasing numbers in both directions. So what that means is Europe and China could be looking directly at each other and uh, in a way that Europe and North America were able to do because of air travel and because of uh, breaking the Atlantic no longer as a barrier, became a bridge. So that would be a historic change, regardless of the politics, China and Europe being able to look directly to each other and trade with each other in that way. That could have massive implications. A lovely thought to end on. Now, I want to just take the last um, show of hands from all of you. So we're kind of 90 minutes on, and we're going to take it this time as a, a friend, a foe, or a fact of life we have to treat fairly. I think that was Martin's, Martin's summation of some kind of category era middle ground. So who thinks China is, who at the end of this 90 minutes discussion thinks China is a friend to us? Can someone run the numbers for me? Um, fewer than before, fewer than Malcolm before. says. Um, who thinks foe? Also fewer. Also fewer. Who thinks fact of life we have to treat fairly? <laughs> <laughs> and that is our winner. Um, so. Well done, you're all very reasonable. You're gonna muddle along in a Martin Wolf version of the world. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to the panel and thank you to Intelligence Squared. It was a great evening.